Thank you for joining us. I'm the National Archives Community Outreach Specialist uh, for under Research Services and the coordinator of the 2017 Virtual Genealogy Fair. And we're moving on to session two. It is entitled 19th Century Ancestors in Tax Assessment Records. And our speaker is Elise Ferriello. Today, Ms. Ferriello will discuss how to find ancestor information using the 19th century tax assessment records in record group 58. In these records, you can find information on where they lived and their community, occupation, I'm sorry, occupations, wealth, and luxury items they may have owned. Ms. Ferriello is an archives technician for the National Archives at Chicago, Illinois. We welcome to the broadcast Elise Ferriello. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining me today. So I'm coming to you from here at the National Archives in Chicago. And in Chicago, we have the records from the Great Lakes states, including Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. The National Archives has regional facilities all throughout the country, and the handout included in this presentation will tell you where to find the tax records for the state you're interested in. So I've spent the last several months processing all the series in Records Group 58, the records of the Internal Revenue Service, that we hold here at NARA Chicago. And most of these are the Civil War tax assessment list. So it's probably difficult to imagine a time when income taxes weren't a major part of every American's life. Most citizens did not have to pay income tax until well into the 20th century. During the 19th century, income taxes were collected sporadically, mostly to pay for major conflicts, and generally only affecting the well-off. The Civil War tax was levied in 1862, and it inspired in 1872, although many of the lists we'll talk about today actually continue into 1874 because they also contain information about business and excise taxes. During the implementation of this tax, the Bureau of Internal Revenue, which wouldn't be called the IRS until 1953, created lists to track who owed and who paid taxes. Uh, next slide, please. Slide number four. These lists can help genealogists fill in some of the details of their ancestors' life. The list may be able to give more insight into an individual's occupation, either by stating it outright, as the list does here for President Abraham Lincoln, or with other context clues, such as where he lived, like the White House, or the item being taxed. With this information, you may be able to seek out even further records in state or local government archives or churches or business records. A researcher may also discover more about how their ancestor, or any individual of interest, lives. As someone who has researched family history myself, I know that we are often looking for information that cuts below the surface. The tax assessment list can tell you what an individual owns, how successful or not they were in their business endeavors. You can track their progress over the course of these 10 years to discover how they fared during the war and in the post-war period. Next slide, please. For instance, if you were researching William Bensel of Iowa, maybe you would already know from the census records that he was a clothing merchant. With the information on the tax assessment list, you can now also know that he had a partner named Jones. You can track Bensel and Jones's growth from 1863, as shown in the middle part of the slide, when their clothing company was valued at $874 to 1866, when it had increased to $1,574. Next slide, please. So you may wonder why the National Archives does not have income tax assessment lists or something similar beyond these 10 years. Next slide, please. To answer that question, we need to look back to the 18th century when a deep-seated loathing of taxes was sewn into the fabric of the United States. Colonial Americans vehemently protested against taxation by the British since they had no direct representative in Parliament. This complaint was a significant contributor to the Revolutionary War and imposing taxes on us without our consent was one of the grievances against King George III listed in the Declaration of Independence. The Articles of Confederation the United States' first go at a constitution, did not give the federal government any taxing power. And this is one of the many reasons why the Articles did not pan out for the young country. In the 1789 U.S. Constitution, uh, that did give the federal government taxing power, but with caveats. Income was usually not taxed. Most federal revenue was instead raised through tariffs, customer duties, 
and land sales. Next slide, please, number eight. In 1791, the House passed the excise whiskey tax, which was highly unpopular, particularly in rural communities. Western farmers relied on grain crops and frequently distilled these grains into liquor, which was easier to ship and preserve. These communities, already often struggling to make ends meet, felt that the tax unfairly targeted them. Their protests culminated in the 1794 Whiskey Rebellion, the first challenge to the young United States federal government. Spurred by Secretary of the Treasury and vocal Federalist Alexander Hamilton, President Washington put an end to the rebellion by calling up a militia force. When anti-federalist Thomas Jefferson was elected, he abolished all internal taxes, including the whiskey. Excise tax made a brief return during the War of 1812, when the government needed funds, but were once again abolished after the war. The outbreak of the Civil War put taxes back on the table. Next slide, please. To help raise funds to pay for the war, Congress passed the Internal Revenue Act in 1862, creating the Bureau of Internal Revenue and establishing the system of tax collection, including creating the tax assessment list. Still, most revenues for the war were raised by excise taxes, particularly on tobacco and alcohol. According to former IRS historian Shelley Davis, the income tax receipts accounted for just under 20% of the total tax revenues. Over 70% came from tobacco and alcohol taxes and other excise and occupational taxes. The tax assessment list do address these business taxes as well as the income ones. Next slide, please. While the income tax was allowed to expire in 1872, the government continued to collect taxes on certain businesses and goods sold, particularly liquor and tobacco. Therefore, the regional branches Holdings often include tax assessment lists into the 20th century. Next slide, please. The holdings that the National Archives has of these later lists are much less comprehensive than the Civil War era. Unlike the earlier lists, which gathered information on anyone making over $600 a year, these lists were just collecting information on businesses subject to the excise laws. One thing that is great about these business tax assessment lists from this later period, as shown in this example of a 1904 assessment list from Ohio, is that they very helpfully include clear definitions of the tax laws they were enforcing, much more so than the earlier list did. Next slide, please, number 12. These later records may be less likely to have useful information for genealogists. But if the person you are researching owned a business, you may be able to find something of note. These records should be considered for use by historians of business or local historians, of which there's a great deal of overlap in genealogy. Here's an example of a list from the Ohio book shown in the last slide. You can see the information collected includes the person or business name, their location, the article or occupation being taxed, penalties assessed, and occasional comments by the assessor. Next slide, please. The idea of income taxes definitely did not disappear in 1872. In fact, the Populist Party sought to implement a graduated income tax in its 1892 party platform. The Revenue Act, or the Wilson-Gorman Tariff Act, reduced tariffs and imposed a 2% income on, tax on income over $4,000. The law was challenged in court, making its way to the Supreme Court, which struck down parts of the law on the grounds that the income tax violated the rule stating direct taxes must be apportioned as laid out in the Constitution, thereby declaring income tax unconstitutional in 1895. Next slide, please. In 1895, after they were declared unconstitutional, Congress required income tax returns to be destroyed. The tax assessment lists were preserved because they contained information on business licenses and other taxes. Next slide, please. Number 15. Over the next 20 years, support for an income tax grew from farmers and populists who were disproportionately affected by high tariffs and by those in government who recognized the country needed more revenue. The 16th Amendment in 1913 legalized income tax in the U.S. by removing the apportionment clause. Income taxes were once again levied to pay for World War I, and over the next century, the tax system developed into the one we all know and love today. Next slide, please. 
NARA does also hold some assessment lists from the period of about 1914 to 1919, after the passing of the 16th Amendment. The Revenue Act of 1913 imposed just a 1% income tax on those who made over $3,000 or couples who made over $4,000 annually. This only impacted less than 1% of the population, far less than the Civil War tax had, and therefore our holdings for this period are far less significant as well. By this time, the collection districts had changed dramatically from what they looked like in the 1860s and 70s, so if you are pursuing someone who may be on these later lists, be aware of that possibility. Next slide, please. However, if you are interested in researching someone who would have fallen into this category or made enough money, much of what we will discuss for the Civil War assessment list will be relevant to these lists as well. Next slide, please, number 18. So I'd like to get back to the Civil War tax assessment list by clarifying that, though we call it the Civil War tax for its decade-long run, the tax outlived the war by a number of years. A project during the 1970s and 80s microfilmed the actual Civil War period of these records, meaning about 1862 to 1866. The microfilm was later digitized and is now available on our partner website, familysearch.org and ancestry.com. So Ancestry is a fee-based website but is available for free at all National Archives research facilities and Family Search should be free from any location. For these records, as is the case with all digitized records, the National Archives will not pull the originals. The list beginning in 1867 were sent to their corresponding regional facilities. And again, you can use the handout provided with this presentation to find out which uh, regional facility you should contact. There are a few exceptions to this. Some states, such as Ohio, Wisconsin, and Massachusetts, were never microfilmed. In those cases, the earlier, meaning 1862 to 1866 lists, are held at the National Archives at Kansas City. The later lists, 1867 and after, should still be at the corresponding regional facility. Next slide, please. In 1862, the Commissioner of Internal Revenue divided each state and territory not in rebellion into collection districts. States that seceded began being taxed as soon as Union troops established control. There could be as few as one district and no more than the number of congressional representatives for each state. Though the collection districts would shift dramatically over the course of the 19th century, this mostly happened after the Civil War tax assessment list series ends. Still, researchers may want to be aware of that possibility. So this is the arrangement researchers will find the records in today. First by state, followed by district, and then by division. Divisions generally correspond to particular counties. From there, the records are arranged alphabetically by surname. Next slide, please, number 20. So for example, here is famed abolitionist and orator Frederick Douglass in the New York 1865 annual list. Douglass was part of Division 8 of Collection District 28, and Division 8 corresponded to Monroe County, which includes the city of Rochester, where Frederick Douglass lived and ran the anti-slavery newspaper, The North Star. Douglass was taxed a total of $87.95 for his income, gold watch, piano, and carriage. Next slide, please. Finding your ancestors on these lists can be somewhat tricky because you have to know where your ancestor lived down to the county. That information is easy enough to find for someone famous like Frederick Douglass. For most 19th century individuals, you would know that information from the census records. Once you know that, you have to determine which district encompass that county. This information can be found in the descriptive pamphlets, sometimes called DPs, produced for the microfilm publications for tax assessment lists 1862 to 1866. Descriptive pamphlets can be found and downloaded in the National Archives microfilm catalog, and they are also reproduced on the first roll of film. Generally, even if you were only interested in records after 1866, it would be most useful to get the district information from the descriptive pamphlet. Next slide, please. So in this example of the descriptive pamphlet for New York, we see that Monroe County is in District 28. The DP also tells us which microfilm rolls to look in for the 1862 to 1866 list. Next slide, please, number 23. For the states like Ohio, Wisconsin, and Massachusetts that were never microfilmed and therefore never digitized, we do not have descriptive pamphlets. 
So we strive to make records as user-friendly as possible, you may be able to find that information in our online catalog as seen for Wisconsin here. If that is not available, staff at the regional facility where those records are held should be able to help you figure out where to begin looking. Next slide. In addition to the NARA produced descriptive pamphlets, there are a few ways of finding the district information from our partner website. If you are looking at the microfilm on NARA partner website, familysearch.org, they divide each state into counties for you. Simply click the state first, as I did here for California, and then the county you are interested in browsing, which I did here for Alameda County. Once you drill down to the county level, Family Search will show you the roles that are available for that county and the district and division that the county corresponds to. On Family Search, the series is not indexed by name. Once you click the role you're interested in, you'll have to browse through the records and it'll look basically like we're looking at it on microfilm. Next slide, please. On NARA's partner website, Ancestry.com, the lists are indexed and searchable. Type in the name you're interested in searching and see what comes up. As with any searchable database, always be aware that misspellings, either on the original records or in the indexing process, can affect your results. If you're not finding the subject, you can always try browsing, as shown in the slide here of the arrow pointing on the right-hand side of the page. If you do find the person you're interested in on microfilm, family search, or on Ancestry, Take note of the district and division. That way, if you want to pursue the later tax assessment list that haven't yet been digitized, you can approach the appropriate regional facility with as much information as possible. Next slide, please, number 26. So when you're ready to look at the 1867 to 1874 list, you'll need to determine which facility would have the records of interest. Many of our regional facilities encourage researchers to make appointments prior to visiting. If you do plan on doing research in person, make sure to check the website of that branch and contact them ahead of time. We're also able to do limited research on behalf of customers via written requests if you don't near, live near the regional facility. The more information you have, the more likely it is a staff member will be able to help you locate records. And finally, for extensive research, if you're unable to visit in person, NARA's website does offer a list of independent researchers for hire. Next slide, please. So once you've found the list you want, whether on microfilm, online, or in person, you want to know what exactly it is you're looking at. The tax laws of 1862, much like tax laws of today, were very complicated. As such, the records are somewhat complicated as well. When you get down to the division, as previously described, the records are further broken up into special lists, monthly lists, and annual lists. Next slide, please. The so-called special lists were used to supplement the incomplete annual and monthly list and included taxes that the assessors deemed special. For example, the special income tax of October 1864. If you're unable to find the individual you're looking for in the regular monthly or annual list, which will be discussed in greater detail in just a moment, don't forget to look for and check the special list, often found attached at the end of the monthly list. Next slide, please. Monthly specific duties were placed on a variety of articles and products ranging from ale to zinc. Monthly taxes were also levied on receipts of transportation companies, interest paid on bonds, surplus funds accumulated by financial institutions, and more. Next slide. The monthly lists are excellent for extracting information on an individual's business, like we did earlier with Bensel and Jones. It's also worth noting just how much data you can find on any one person. For example, here is boot and shoe salesman Ruben Savage of Mount Rose, New Jersey. Perhaps this little limited information in the July 1866 tax assessment list doesn't provide you with a ton more information about Ruben's life. In it, we see where he lived, the type of business he had, how much that business was worth, and what he was taxed on it. Next slide, please. However, given that same information once a month for four years and more if you're able to go to the regional facility, you can really gain a lot of insight into how someone was living. For an example, here is a screenshot of all of the results for Ruben Savage in the tax assessment list from Ancestry. Next slide, please. There aren't too many records in the National Archives that so regularly and frequently track 
any, aspect of the, any one aspect of the life of the average American. Undoubtedly, the information recorded would be invaluable to the descendants of that individual. Beyond that, though, these records should be noted for their value to business historians, local historians, and labor researchers. The records can provide valuable insight into the movement and activities of certain groups of people, like immigrants at the time or women in business. Though the lists themselves do not track that information, some data can be interpreted by using names or other context clues. Next slide, please. So in these IRS tax records, the two certainties of life, death and taxes, sometimes merge, as in this May 1868 list um, on the left-hand side of the page, which shows Alva Green handling the estate of Reverend M. Duncan. This is a trove of information on the family. We learn that Reverend Duncan left $5,149 to three daughters, and that they were each taxed 1%. The lists also uniquely show the diaspora of Duncan women in Cleveland, Newport, and Concord, as well as their married names. For another example, on the right-hand side of the page, you can see there were many wills executed in March of 1865 in Cynthia, Kentucky. And though this record doesn't tell us why exactly there were so many wills executed in Cynthia, we may be able to find more information using additional records of newspapers or obituaries. Next slide, please. To slide number 34. Annual licenses were required of a variety of professions, including bankers, tobacconists, jugglers, confectioners, li livery stable keepers, cattle brokers, soap makers, oil distillers, peddlers, and more. Additionally, various institutions, like hotels, inns, and taverns, paid an annual license, and annual stamp duties were imposed on legal and business documents, medicines, cosmetics and other items. Next slide, please. Annual tax was compiled into two lists, the names of people residing in the division who were liable for taxation, and the names of people outside the division who owned property in the division. Under each name were recorded the value of assessment and the amount of duty or tax due. The act made it the duty of any person liable to the annual income tax to file a list of income and taxable property with the assistant assessor in the division in which he or she resided. The assessment lists were turned over to the collector of internal revenue, who then posted a notice in each county within the, in the district. The one seen here was pasted on the back of one of the Ohio tax assessment list volumes. In the notice, the collector specified the time and place when he would be collecting the taxes due. Next slide, please. Beginning in 1862, Americans paid 3% tax on income over $600 and 5% tax on income over $10,000. In 1864, the rate increased and the ceiling dropped so that Americans now paid 5% income, 5% uh, tax on income over $600 and 10% tax on income over $5,000. Next slide, please. These records cover a relatively short but a prolific period of U.S. history. In addition to the Civil War, the Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation and 13th Amendment legally ended slavery in the United States, Reconstruction began in the South, and the Indian Wars continued in the West. The 1860s saw the completion of the first transcontinental railroad and the Homestead Act that sent many Americans westward. From these records, a researcher may be able to track the success of their ancestor or a historical figure of note. For example, the record displayed here shows infamous showman P.T. Barnum doing pretty well for himself in 1863. In addition to his fairly spectacular $19,400 income, he possessed a number of carriages and 700 grams of silver plate. He paid a total of $978 in taxes. Even compared to his well-off neighbors in the Fairfield, Connecticut area, who were paying between six and $250 in taxes, Barnum was doing exceedingly well. Next slide, please. Clearly, the ongoing Civil War did not have a negative impact on Barnum's business. In 1864, he reported $35,000 in income, an impressive $15,600 increase. That year, he paid over $1,700 in taxes. According to historian and former, former NARA employee, Cynthia G. Fox, paying income taxes was a point of nationalistic pride during the Civil War. Barnum, a noted abolitionist, may have partaken in this particular patriotism. 
Perhaps even more so, after Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation in the earlier year. Next slide, please. Certainly anyone who made enough to pay the income tax is doing pretty well for themselves. To further contextualize the information, like Barnum's salary, or how much his neighbors in Connecticut were worth, researchers can consult the contemporary work, the cost of labor and substance in the United States for the year 1869, which showed the average cost of provisions, consumer goods, and rent, as well as average salaries for professions. In addition, people can consult the special report on immigration, which was compiled to provide information to newly arrived immigrants on what they can expect to find and pay for new homes and other items. These publications can give you further insight into what the information found on the assessment list meant for your ancestors' daily life. Next slide, please, number 40. So it's all well and good to find famous rich people like Barnum in these assessment lists, but all kinds of Americans were captured in these records. Take G.M. Hinckley of Illinois. Hinckley lived in Perry County, covered by the first division of District 13. He paid $5 in 1863 for his license to deal retail. Next slide, please. Though limited in detail, the list tells us that Hinckley was doing fairly well for himself, too. By 1867, he had an income of $1,200 and a gold watch, too. Next slide. And here he is again in 1871, renewing his license, this time which was specified as a retail liquor dealer. Next slide, please, number 43. So I mentioned earlier how the monthly list could be used by a variety of other historical purposes beyond genealogy, and I'd offer that the annual lists are particularly of value to local historians. By tracking the annual list, one can really get a sense of a town or a city. The list can reveal the rise of certain industries and track who was involved in certain trades. They can tell us how communities changed or how they didn't over the course of these 10 years. Next slide, please. So for example, on this one page of Indiana District 1, Division 4, in 1867, we can see where the locals of Vincennes, Indiana would have gone for a drink to brewer John Elmer's. He even had a billiard table for the Hoosiers to enjoy. Or they could get their liquor at the Gimble Bros if they preferred. They could go bowling at Emon's, get their sweets at confectioner Everwine, and hire lawyer W.H. DeWolf to handle their legal affairs. Next slide, please. Four years later, we can see what has changed and what has stayed the same in Vincennes. Clearly, the retail alcohol business is doing well, with Ebner's Brewery and the Gimbel Bros still in business, as well as many more liquor and tobacco dealers. It looks like a number of businesses from the 1867 list fell by the wayside. However, the list did not tell the whole story. Next slide, please. And that brings us to some of the limitations of these assessment lists. They only tracked a limited amount of information, providing a snapshot of someone's life. Did some of these other individuals leave the area? Did they change careers? Did their businesses fail, or did they not make enough money to get on the list that year? There is added complication because the assessors only listed people with some margin of success. Unlike the census, at least from 1870 and onward, which captured people of all socioeconomic statuses, um, all races, ethnicities, and genders, the assessment list only captured people who had a business or a career that required a license or made more than $600 a year. Even if you know for sure that the person you are researching did one of those things, if you do not know exactly where that person lives, it can still be hard to find them on the list. Adding to that, the list will often only use someone's first initial with their surname. And you may find that there are gaps in these records. Next slide, please, number 47. But don't let those reasons discourage you from looking through this resource. We can use other NARA records to account for some of these issues. Take F.G. Eberwine, the confectioner from Vincennes, Indiana, who we found in the 1867 assessment list, but not in the 1871 list. From just the annual list, we would not know what happened to F.G. Eberwine. However, looking at the census records can help. Here he is on the right in the 1860 census, listed as a baker and confectioner. If we look to the record on the left, in the 1870 census, it shows that he had gone into the coal business. So it's hard to extrapolate too much from the records available, though it does explain why he was no longer on the assessment list in 1871. Perhaps the confectionery business of Indiana 
was affected by a downturn in the economy, and while sweets were a luxury, everyone needed coal. Next slide, please. The tax assessment list can take us beyond the census records, too. Here we see J.S. Van Valkenburg in the 1870 annual list of Indiana District 9. Van Valkenburg was taxed on his wholesale retail liquor businesses, as well as being a tobacco dealer and an insurance agent. He was a busy man. Um, if you note the arrow pointing toward the left, there's a little X near his name. Next slide, please. So if we look to the records in the nearest federal court, to so where Mr. Van Valkenburg lived, which was Indianapolis, we can see that in 1869, James Van Valkenburg was charged with not having paid his taxes. Um, and if you are interested in pursuing the district court records, they are held in NARA Record Group 21. Next slide, please, number 50. So within the case file, you could see that Van Valkenburg was charged with engaging in the business and occupation of selling and offering for sale distilled spirits without having paid the special tax as required by law. It looks like Van Valkenburg learned his lesson in 1869, having paid his taxes the next year, but not without getting noted on the 1870 assessment list. Next slide, please. The United States District Court records are littered with people accused of not paying taxes or obtaining the proper licenses during this period. Here is an example from the District Court in Milwaukee, where John Cohn, who was also accused of selling liquor without paying taxes. This case, this case includes an affidavit from the Collector of Internal Revenue in the 1st District of Wisconsin, which oversaw Milwaukee. Next slide, please. And here's one more example of James Pritchett of Indiana, who was charged for, with practicing law without having the appropriate license. The court records really helped drive home how these taxes impacted people's lives and changed the way Americans at the time were interacting with the federal government. Next slide, please, number 53. Women may be less represented on these lists, but the, assess the, but the assessment list tracked anyone who owned a business or made over $600 a year, regardless of their gender. Here is suffragist and speaker Elizabeth Cady Stanton on the list for New York. The list showcased how major events, such as the Civil War, changed the business world, even if temporarily. During the Civil War, when the men were off fighting, women held down many of the jobs, the farms, and the shops, and they are represented as doing so in these lists. Next slide, please. So for example, on this page, we can see Mrs. Sarah Barrett in Montgomery, Alabama, as the breadwinner for her family in 1866, running a retail liquor store. The 1866 August assessment list is the image in the back of the slide. So the lists themselves don't tell us where Mr. Barrett is. Was he on his way home fighting? In the, from the war, or was he ill, or something else entirely, here is a likely candidate for the family in 1870 on the left, with Mr. David Barrett working as a baggage maker. In 1880, on the right, we see that Sarah is a widow and making her money in the retail grocery business. Through these documents, we can pick up the rough sketches of Mrs. Barrett's life and know that she had experience in retail and relied on her selling skills when her family needed. Next slide, please. In these records, you can uncover amazing Americans like Elizabeth Keckley. Keckley was born into slavery in Virginia, purchased her freedom, and moved to Washington, D.C. There she created a successful business working as a seamstress with some of the political elite, including First Lady Mary Todd Lincoln. Here she is in the February 1865 list, taxed on her business worth an impressive $2,000. Next slide, please. Civil War tax assessment lists are one of the many NARA records held in our regional facilities that can greatly help genealogists find their ancestors and learn about how those ancestors lived. They provide unique insight into the arrangement of communities in the 1860s and 70s and the implementation of complicated tax laws and their impact on American lives. If you are interested in pursuing this resource, remember you will need to begin by knowing where your ancestor lives and use either the descriptive pamphlet familysearch.org Ancestry.com or staff at a regional facility to find out which assessment list your ancestor may be on. If you know what kind of business they ran or occupation they had, that may let you know if you want to check the monthly or annual list. However, the list for any one district and division 
generally are not so voluminous, and it may be easier just to check both. If you are fortunate, you may be able to find a wealth of information from your home computer or a computer at a NARA research facility. If you are able to get to a regional facility, you may be able to dig through some oversized old volumes to find your ancestor's name and information about their business and hometown, as scrawled by a tax assessor long ago. So I hope this presentation will inspire genealogists to seek out these useful records, help researchers understand how to find and use their ancestors in these records, and understand what we can learn about 19th century life from tax records. Next slide, please. So thank you so much for joining. And please let me know if you have any questions. Oh, pardon. Thank you, Elise. As you can, uh, you might not know this, but uh, we've been working on our audio portion. So thank you for bearing with us. Um, Elise, thank you so much for your presentation. We do have an uh, important question that comes in often and help us out. But it's about reference reports. Uh, the question is, is there a reference report for the lists that have been, have not, have not been microfilmed? I don't believe we have a reference report for that. Um, on the handout I provided, it does say which lists were not microfilmed, and I believe that I captured all of the ones that weren't. Um, but if ever anyone's having trouble, they should always contact the regional facility, and um, you know, we'll let you know if the records are somewhere else. Thank you so much. Thank you for that answer. Um, in regards to that, someone uh, had asked a question about New England and East Coast states and where those records are located. However, um, do you mind going over how uh, the record centers, how, why certain records are in different locations, for the, in particular for the records you're discussing? Why are um, you know, records in a particular region? Regional facilities cover particular states. So in uh, NARA Chicago, we cover Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Ohio, the Great Lakes states. Um, and other regional facilities cover other states. So for the outliers that may seem strange that are in Kansas City, um, it's actually that the records that were microfilmed were sent to Kansas City to be stored there. Um, and that just when they sent them over, they included the ones that were never microfilmed. And so that's why those, that era, the 1862 to 1866 list, are at the National Archives at Kansas City. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Um, let's see, we have another question that's come in, and it is, is there a way to guess at income based on a tax? For example, my ancestor paid $10 for 182 cattle. So how does one guess, uh, the in guess their income based on a tax? That's a good question. So you may want to check out some of those um, additional contemporary resources I mentioned. And if anyone's interested, I'd be happy to send them the links to them that have information on what certain items were worth. There may also be information within the records themselves. So like I mentioned earlier, the, the later lists have all the tax laws that they were enforcing written right on them. So for those lists, it would probably say what each cattle was worth and how much it was taxed. For the earlier lists, you may be able to find that in maybe newspapers or some other kind of contemporary record where people would have had to look to know what they were going to be taxed on. Thank you, Elise. Uh, let's give it just one moment. Do we have any more questions from our audience? I don't have any more queued up at this moment. We are getting a lot of thank yous. Um, uh, one person commented to you, Elise, uh, a very informative presentation. So thank you very much.